Great, thank you. We'll make a start. And for those who uh, are coming in late, Ben, you'll do the honours of letting them in, please. Absolutely. But a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. My name is Roy Magara, for those who don't know me. I'm an employment solicitor, currently based in Vista, although I act for clients nationwide. I have a, a real privilege, actually, of being joined today by a number of experts in their field. They've got Ben Thompson, who owns Hello there. Ben, you can introduce yourself, actually, instead of me doing it all for you. So, so I run Thompson and Terry Recruitment. We're, um, we're a mix between a headhunting firm and a recruitment agency. Thank you very much. And Zoe Lidster. Morning, everybody. Zoe Lidster from Harwood HR Solutions. We provide outsourced HR support to businesses of all sizes. Thank you. And Sheila Lord. Oh, good morning. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sheila Lord from BMR Health and Wellbeing, and we work with organisations um, to identify the source of workplace stress rather than simply managing the symptom. Thank you very much. So you're welcome to have your cameras on, cameras off. It's completely up to you in terms of how you feel comfortable. There'll be lots of time at the end in terms of interaction and engagement, which we hope this is what it's all going to be about. The focus on today's webinar is about the future of work. The pandemic has shown us that actually a lot can change and that has got to do with our, the way we work, our flexible hours, the way we recruit, the way we work from home, etc. or mix all of that up. A lot to do with our mental health too. And this session is hopefully going to be really helpful for employers and employers alike in terms of figuring it, it all out. Uh, I'm going to be hosting today's session, but first and foremost, I've got the pleasure of handing over to Ben Thompson to talk over his section. Ben, over to you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Roy. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming today. Um, so um, today um, I'm going to be speaking um, as part of the future of work. Um, very, very... Um, can we have next slide, please, Roy? Um, so in terms of the question that I've been um, asked to answer is what actions can companies and candidates respectively take now to prepare for the future of work? Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, about what we're seeing in the market um, and where we're at currently, but also um, really going to be answering that question in terms of what, what small and indeed large companies um, can, can take away. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so agenda, I'm not going to bore you too much with an introduction, um, but then I'm going to give an update on the market. We're going to talk about what candidates are actually looking for, what employers are looking for, um, also how to efficiently hire um, during and post pandemic. Um, and then we're going to come on to um, a little bit of time for questions at the end. Could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so just a little bit of introduction um, on me. Um, very, very briefly, um, I set up um, Thompson & Terry eight years ago. Um, we are a recruitment business um, that um, typically work on recruitment agency level vacancies, um, but our approach is very much headhunting. Um, so we don't register candidates, we very much headhunt um, candidates into the roles. Um, I'm also um, involved in team, um, it's 960 independent recruitment businesses. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the employment market, um, what are we seeing in the employment market? Let's let's go through a couple of stats first, um, and then we're going to come on to, on to my view. So next slide, please. Um, I always think um, there's lots and lots of stats out there, and you can read it in lots of different ways. I think that what we're seeing, um, or what we're hearing, um, is that um, there's, there's a real shortage of workers um, and that, um, which is absolutely true. But I think that one thing to look at the economy is about the total total pace, number of hours worked, how much are people being paid? And actually what we see is during the pandemic, it really, really went down. But actually, if we're looking at what's happened following that pandemic, we're actually seeing a real, real, real growth. Um, I think it's been very well documented about the shortage of drivers, but actually we're seeing that a lot of work is happening at the moment. Um, there's there's a, lot, um, a, a lot of money going around. And I think that the economy is certainly recovering. The employment market, I was on a Teams call um, about four weeks ago now, 960 recruitment business owners. Uh, there was a poll, is it harder to get candidates than it ever has been before? And 960 out of 960 voted yes. So, uh, so that'll give you an idea of the market. And um, next slide, please. 
which definitely comes on to the number of um, vacancies currently being advertised. Um, so if we go right back to 2001, um, you can see that there has been, um, of course, um, changes um, throughout periods. Um, there, there's been a couple of recessions in there, but I think that none of us predicted what was going to happen um, 20 months ago now. Um, however, we are seeing that there's growth and growth and growth, and now we're getting up to kind of re record figures. Certainly um, with, with my, my baby phase, I've never seen anything like this before, but, but I, don't think, uh, I don't think a lot of people double my age have, have, have certainly seen this. There's a lot of vacancies there. I think that there's some, some real factors ar around work, just to kind of remember. Um, Bre Brexit has happened, so we've got less workers. I think that um, there's been record numbers of, of candidates that are going back into university or back into some form of education. Um, combined with that, um, there have, have been a number of deaths. I think that there's, there's a number of um, contrasting figures that are being reported about how many workers have actually passed, passed away, but actually it's, it's a lot higher than we think, so it's well over 30%. Um, so if you combine all of that, it's all like supply and demand. Companies are growing and looking to recover but at the same time, um, there is absolutely um, a, a, a real shortage. So I guess going back to the question, we need to be um, more competitive than ever before because candidates have got choice. They're no longer the times where there's only two or three vacancies they can look at. Now they're being hit by lots of different angles. And in the digital age, um, they're constantly being served with, with, with opportunities. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, in fact, I, I, I've probably covered, covered that quite a lot, but I think what we're seeing a lot more is um, the candidates have the power. It, it's very much a candidate market at the moment. And the, the days have gone where an employer can sit down and say to a candidate, you need to sell yourself to me um, without selling the company. It's a two way relationship. So we need to do what we can what we can do to get candidates in front of you. But then at the same time, as an employer, you need to talk about a lot more now than just salary you know what what is the flexibility around the role what are the benefits but also what's your mission statement what's your values how are you going to offer that full full, full relationship to um that employee how are they going to grow how are they how are they going to develop um next slide please i think um i, I think what um what, what, what we're seeing here as well is um, particularly under kind of the, 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 un, the, the low level vacancies potentially um, kind of across the board. We are actually seeing that there are still unemployed. Um, there, there are still actually unemployed candidates in the market, but I think that a lot of, of, of clients that are advertising. That's okay. No, 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 wait, let me there we go perfect um, <laughs> thank you um so we are seeing that um there are um still high volumes of applications but also often the gung-ho approach i think people are still being let go from employment and i think that there still is that fear factor in the market so what we're often seeing is when a candidate does let go they're often applying for 50, 60, 70 jobs because it's so easy to apply for jobs now. It's a click of a button and actually often not taking the time to, to, to decide whether that role is, is, is right. So what I'm urging employers to do is really, really check the basics, really check that they've seen what the hours are, they've seen where you're based, seen um, what the job in, in, in involves um, to, save, um, to, to, to save, save time. I think the, the big thing that has come out of COVID whilst the employment market in, in many ways, is stronger than it's ever been before. We, we are seeing that employed candidates are so nervous to move. They're still seeing on the news that um, the company owes, the, the, the country owes lots of money. Um, we're still seeing um, that, um, that, that things could go bad in winter. So I think candidates actually need their hand held a lot more. I think the hand candidates really kind of need that support and that um, I guess reassurance um, to, to to move, and then I suppose the final thing that I'd say on on, on this slide is um, it's been widely reported that there's a shortage of HGV drivers, but actually there is a real shortage in some of the roles that you wouldn't typically think. So, for example, um, 
good salespeople are like gold dust in Oxfordshire. Um, and the reason for it is if you run a business and you've got a good salesperson, you're not going to want to lose them when, when you're growing. So we're seeing often such an inflate, such inflated salaries to keep the very, very best people. Next slide, please. So what are candidates looking for? What can we do to make this a little bit different? What, what can we do to stand out? Could we go to the next slide? Firstly, a job. Um, I think the biggest thing at the moment is a fast recruitment process with so much competitive, um, so, much, so many competitors, so so many opportunities, so many things being thrown at each candidate. Um, I, was, I was at breakfast today with, with somebody within, within quite technical property um, and they were saying that candidates are applying for a job and, and, and they're gone within a day. Um, so I absolutely, I so strongly agree and it'd be interesting to hear Zoe's thoughts on this you still need to have a really, really thorough and in-depth and fair recruitment process, but do it quickly. So there's no reason why you need to have a closing date and, and you need to have two weeks until you have interviews. You need to move quickly. Security is such a big thing now. Um, three years ago, no interviewer or very few would say, we're a really safe company. We've got lots of money in the bank um we don't we're not going to make redundancies we've got lots of future plans we've got our plan b c and d now you need to say that so think about what's going to assure a candidate to join a business be part of the vision the point below but at the same time have have that security and this is the future of work i think being flexible a nice place to work with a real vision and and, and i think money's no longer a factor it's about how what does that 10-year journey look like um, stats will tell us most candidates won't stay in a job for 10 years, but actually you need to tell, sell that 10 year journey and really work with them to say, we're going to support you. We're going to do lots of really great things. These are our values. This is what we're going to give to you. And this is what you're going to be part of. Candidates want to be part, parts um, of, of, of journeys. Next slide, please. What employers are looking for? I'm going to move very, very quickly through this because I think most of you are employers. Next slide, please. Skills and experience, longevity. So candidates are looking for a long job. Candidates want to work. Um, candidates are going to be a little bit flexible. And I think that um, candidates are really buying into, into the values. Next slide, please. How to efficiently hire. I think we've touched on this a lot, but I think the really, really big thing is about really thinking about how do you get the right person and what skills can be trained and what do they need straight away and then it's about get making yourself really attractive gone are the days where candidates will come rushing to you but you need to make yourself attractive and you need to think about how are how am i going to stand out how am i going to get their name out there so then when they're approached they already know who thompson and terry recruitment are or they already know who ex estate agent is or or, or ex HR business or, or whatever else it's all about being um all about being really really exciting and having that process ready uh, and uh, and candidates want to know everything up front so to make that process seamless next slide please I think um in fact I'm going to move past the slide I I promised Roy I'd be seven minutes and I'm, um, I told him I'd definitely do it in seven minutes. I'm going too quick. Next slide, please. Brilliant. That is me done. Over to you, Zoe. Thank you. Before passing on, Ben, you mentioned a number of really good points. Because, <clears throat> for example, I read a stat uh, on one of PwC's reports that about 49% of candidates rejected the the offer of recruitment because of the recruitment process itself so that, that's quite a high figure and you do raise a number of really good points about how employers can make sure that they can show through that recruitment process how that employee is going to fit into the business's future yeah. what the inclusion policy looks like in terms of its workforce whether it's diverse or not uh, and you mentioned a really good point about uh, what are the values and the mission statement. I think that's really important for employers mm. to get across. Um, one question, please, before we pass on to the next, next person to speak to Sheila. And just for all of you uh, guys who are watching and listening too, if you've got questions and comments, you're welcome to put them in the chat box or there'll be a good sort of half an hour or so from one o'clock for you to just unmute yourselves 
and now it's completely up to you in terms of how you feel comfortable. Uh, but Ben, before I pass on to Sheila, I've just got a quick question here. Uh, what actions can companies and candidates respectively take now from today to prepare for the future of work? Okay, so really, really simple. Um, if you are a company, the really good thing is about thinking about that whole journey. So don't just wait until you're hiring. It's about making yourself a really, really cool place to work. So, so one of our biggest companies, uh, one of our biggest clients, and, and I'm happy to share this, is a business um, in Oxford called Oodle Car Finance. So they're one of the three fastest growing businesses um, in Europe. They've won tons and tons of awards in the Times Top 100 employers, and they, they are hiring. Um, but what they do really, really well is they put lots of videos about what it's like in the office. They share about a lot, um, some of the volunteering that they do overseas. They talk about um, some of the sports teams they've got. They talk so much about their values and their mission statement and the future of the company. So I think the big thing um, from a marketing point of view is market all of those great things. I think the big thing to do from a getting ready um, is talking to people like Zoe and Sheila about, OK, so how do you support candidates with mental health? How can you get your how can you get your team involved um, in your mission statement and your values and really believe in it? And I think that it's about having a really rounded business that has that people will want to work for, will want to talk about. Um, I think that one of the things the pandemic taught so many companies is they weren't ready for something going wrong. So another client of ours just didn't have that capability to work from home. And they really, really struggled, although they were a really good business because they just hadn't prepared. Um, so I think always leave lots of choices and leave lots of things in place to have that flexibility that actually, if there is a snow day and snow gets really bad with global warming, you, you, can, you can recover. I think if you're a candidate, it's about getting involved in as many things as possible, making sure that your LinkedIn's updated. Keep asking for recommendations when you're working with people over a period of time. Can you volunteer with charities in your own time? Um, what, what can you do that's ex extracurricular to build your experience? But then in your working life, how can you improve over a period of time? Because actually, um, by preparing for the future of work, if you're building up all of those things, and as a candidate, you need to be flexible as well, um, you can quickly you can quickly flex and, and you've got those skills now in, in the future because I think employers and employers and candidates are both looking for more than just a job now and then both sides are looking for a rounded candidate and a rounded job so how can you prepare those things early is planning for the future and start implementing you know mental health training start implementing really strong values start as a candidate start building your experience and your network and your um, extracurricular stuff um, because then you're going to be more more desirable in the future and, and those things are just so so key um, at least 15 percent um, to 20 percent of our clients um, are really really looking for candidates who have done stuff outside works of good stuff um, and actually if you asked me that five years ago five percent maybe so it's really really growing so to so start thinking about what can you do to be a more full person I think it's a big thing. Super, thank you very much, Ben, for that insightful answer. Without further ado, Sheila, I'll pass on to you for your section. Thank you, Roy. Um, yeah, so just, you know, following on from what Ben's been saying, you know, you know, people are in demand um, and that tide has changed where employers, as you say, Ben, have to market themselves um, as well as the employees or the prospective um, employees do. Um, and, you know, once we've got our candidates, once we've gone through this recruitment process, once we've identified and brought those people on, we need to be able to keep them. OK, now, if you look at the size of the workplace um, related stress, depression or anxiety um, in the UK, the figures are absolutely huge. OK, so we're bringing people into the workplace, but we're bringing them into workplaces that make them ill. When we're signing up for that contract, when we're looking at that recruitment process, nowhere in there are we signing up to be made ill by our jobs, okay? And at the moment, the figures are very evident that that is exactly what is happening. If you look at these statistics here, these are from the HSE and the Labour Force Survey. In 
Um, last year, as of March 2020, so pre-COVID, the number of working days um, lost attributable to work-related stress, depression or anxiety was 17.9 million working days. OK, so that's up 12.8 million days. Uh, sorry, it's up from 12.8 million days, should I say. So that's a 5 million days lost increase in a 12 month period. The numbers are fantastically high that account for more than 50 percent of sickness in the workplace. So we've got a really, really big problem in the UK. So we're going to be having all of this recruitment process and going to all this time and effort to bring good people into our business. We need to make sure that we're actually retaining them. OK, and, and the, this way that we can do that is by creating a nice work environment, a great culture, living those values, living those mission statements, not just having them as very nice um, um, kind of thoughts, if you will. We need to be living those uh, values as an organisation. And um, we can go on to the next slide, please, Roy. Um, so when it comes to the future of work, what does that look like? You know, post pandemic, um, we don't know yet, I think figures are going to come out at the end of this month, um, updated on the Labour Force survey, what those numbers are going to be. I think we can all hazard a guess that those stress numbers or stress related sicknesses will have gone up. OK, uh, stress related sickness, again, it's going to be a difficult one because how many people have hidden that while they've been working um, from home over the last 12 months? Very, very difficult to gauge. Um, but we've definitely got an issue OK, in the UK. And what we do in uh, our approaches to workplace mental health um, is that we spend a lot of time training people in resilience. We train people how to cope and we train them how to identify and know when they're struggling. However, these approaches are not enough. OK, we keep doing these approaches. Um, and expecting a different result every time. And I see a lot of um, social media posting around whether or not we should make mental health first aid in the workplace um, a legal requirement. And I think before we start going off and start bringing in all of these, let's do this because this will make things really good, we need to really understand what the current legislation is around the workplace uh, when it comes to psychological health and safety. Because under the Health and Safety at Work Act, an employer has a duty of care to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health, safety and welfare of all employees. And we do safety really well, OK, um, in most organisations. Um, and safety is regulated, and I'm talking physical safety. But when it comes to psychological safety, the things that can contribute to our stress, be it high workloads, be it low uh, role clarity, be it... Um, low levels of autonomy none of this is being looked after okay but the health and safety at work act is clear we have an employer uh, and a duty of care as an employer um, and in the way that we're supposed to execute that duty of care is through a risk assessment and again we'll do risk assessments when it comes to physical safety but organizations because they're not regulated because the hse isn't out there enforcing it on a regular basis they bypass you know, a lot of times um, the actual requirement, the legal requirement to conduct a psychological risk assessment. OK, and they'll often go down the route of, well, I'm doing an engagement survey. I consult with my employees. That engagement survey becomes my risk assessment. Well, actually, it doesn't, because, again, in a lot of organisations, historically, a risk assessment, uh, sorry, an engagement survey has been conducted. People uh, in the organisation at a senior leadership level, maybe somebody in HR, um, in conjunction with some other managers, may make some decisions as to what would be a good idea to solve those issues. And there's very little consultation done with the employee. Or worst case scenario that I've seen in the past is the um, engagement surveys carried out. And the senior leadership team look at it and go, oh, I don't really know how to fix that. I'm just going to park it. Park it for next year, see if the survey results are any better. OK, we can't do that. OK, uh, we need to have these risk assessments in place. And actually, by conducting a risk, uh, sorry, by conducting an engagement survey and doing nothing about it, 
from a legal perspective, you're putting yourself in a worse position than having not done the survey in the first place because you've introduced foreseeability. You know there are issues in the workplace and you're choosing to ignore them. So there's a lot of change um, in terms of an awareness with employers now um, across the UK. And that awareness is being further strengthened by additional guidance um, information that's out there widely available to all employers. So we've got the health and safety executive, they produced stress management standards back in 2004, which talked about how businesses should look at approaching workplace stress by looking at organisational resilience, by looking at organisational factors rather than individual factors. And I always use the analogy, and I, I'm trying to find a better one because um, it makes it's not very positive when it comes to mental health, but if we've got a production um, equipment on a factory floor and the production equipment is throwing out um, substandard products or rejects, and something that's not quite up to the level of quality that we want it to be, we would not employ a team of people to start looking at how we fix those um, products that are below par. What we would do is we would go to the machine and we would fix the machine that's producing an output that's below par. So why, when it comes to people and stress, if we look at that in a similar context, why are we trying to fix people that the machine is causing illness to? OK, we're not going back to the machine. We're not going back to the workplace. We're not going back to the environment. So in June of this year, um, there was an international standard, an ISO standard um, released um, that gives really granular detail, advice, support and guidance to employers on how to do psychological health and safety and risk management in a simple framework that's aligned to ISO 45001 or in old money ISO 18001. And if you're thinking, what's she talking about with all these ISO numbers, okay, they're just a documented framework. It's been pulled together of what to do and how to do it, the areas to look at, um, what you need within your business to make that happen as a, as a continuous and a, and a systemic part of your business process to really guide you and help you through. Well, if you'd like to, up on the next slide, please. So going back to um, what the whole topic of this is in the future of work, you know, we've got these current approaches when it comes to managing mental health in the workplace, and I touched on this before, but we've got mental health first aid, okay? There are more than half a million people trained, and I think it's actually up to about three quarters of a million people trained now in mental health awareness or training of some sort in the UK. Most employers will offer you an employee assistance programme, all great, all essential parts to have. They're focused on when you're ill, okay? That's great. We don't advertise as a company benefit that we've got physical first aid is to patch you up when you fall down the stairs where there was a wonky banister. So why are we promoting mental health first aiders as a great solution for psychological health and well-being in the workplace? And we'll have exercise classes, we'll have meditation, we'll have mindfulness. This has been a growing trend in terms of approaches to workplace mental health um, over the last five years. Yet, going back to what I was saying earlier, the situation is the worst it's ever been in terms of sick days. So we keep doing the same things and expecting a different result. And we need to change. We need to be taking a more proactive approach that's looking at the work environment and risk assessing that in a more proactive um, manner. Yeah. So we move on to the next slide. So I appreciate I'm possibly running over time here. Um, I'll get in close to. If we look at workplace mental health, we've got people across all different levels of where they are with the workplace, with the, with their psychological health, in the same way that we have people uh, at different levels on their on their physical health. So somebody, you know, on a physical level, you might be really into your fitness, you're a triathlon already, you're out there, you're running, you're doing this, that, and the other, uh, and you're really motivated, you're mentally, um, physically very um, well. Okay. The mental health equivalents that would be flourishing. You know, we're flourishing, we're winning, we're firing on, on cylinders, we're really kind of on top of our game. The majority of us wouldn't live in that physical or mental wellness extreme um, all of the time. The majority of us are going to exist in mental wellness and physical wellness as we would do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then from time to time, we'll get either physically ill, we'll get a cold, we'll feel a bit run down, 
or we'll become psychologically unwell. We might have a bereavement, we might be going through divorce. Life throws us a few curveballs that knock us off our feet, okay? And then sometimes those curveballs those few days can extend into longer periods of time and we might become either more um, physically ill and we might also become more um, mentally ill. Yeah, so we require further support. In any business, you've got people sat across that whole spectrum, okay, of um, mental wellness in terms of that continuum. People will be everywhere, yet the approaches that we take are very focused on the mitigating illness bit. We're not doing any, we're not doing enough to capture the people that are in that area where they may be struggling. Um, we're not doing enough to maintain the people that are well. We need to be looking at the work design, the work organization, and the work factors. Let's look at what's causing the stress and look to work on that, be it systems, be it um, bureaucracy, be it, you know poor management support, be it poor co-worker support, be it poor team working. We need to look at those factors because if we remove something that's causing you a problem in your day-to-day -day job, are you, you no longer have to fill out 17 forms just to get signed off to buy a pen, yeah? Then um, we're taking away that stress factor, yeah? But telling me to go on a course to manage my stress levels and my resilience levels because I'm getting annoyed because it takes 17 steps to get myself a pen, isn't really going to make them feel any better, okay? Um, so we have to have this change. And there is, I'm definitely seeing um, a shift in change in understanding and a shift in change in attitudes now with employers that get that actually, if I just remove the problem that's causing the stress in the workplace, the stress goes away. It's really quite simple, okay? Um, I'm not sure if that's all my slides done there, Roy, if I've got another one. <laughs> so yeah, yes. just the jargon <laughs> you just pop back to the jargon you'll see a lot of these words coming out over the next few months especially if you are familiar with things like the standard but when we're talking about psychosocial risk psychosocial risk management the word psychosocial is just anything around us that we respond to in an emotional way okay and this is very much about looking at how it impacts an individual because i will react differently to having to fill out 17 forms for a pen than Roy would, because Roy loves filling forms out, yeah? Gives him more reason to use his pen, okay? Um, so we'll all respond differently because as human beings, we're all different emotionally, okay? And then when we're talking about psychosocial hazards, these are the aspects of work design, i.e. the things in our environment, how we do the job, our social factors at work. These are the hazards that have a potential to become this, okay? Because again, they'll impact me differently than they'll impact Roy, than Ben, and then Zoe. Um, and then this risk assessment piece is just this legal duty that we have to assess and control those aspects of work design that can actually have a negative impact on us, okay? And the good thing about doing it this way, um, if we go on to the next slide, Roy, please, is that we can measure it. We can actually measure well-being, who knew, okay? And going back to Ben, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could understand and know what your staff, staff attrition levels are, yeah? Because if we can stop people leaving the building, and sorry, Ben, I don't want to like, put you, like, not having any recruitment work here, but, you know, we'd have less need for recruitment. We would have less costs in recruitment. You know, we can actually look and measure direct correlations between, you know, once we've got happier staff, are our productivity levels going up? Once our staff are more happy and engaged, once our staff are being more creative, contributing more, having a psychologically safe workplace where they feel confident to speak out with ideas, does our productivity go up? Does our service levels go up? Do our quality levels go up? Okay, so we can start to measure the impact that we're having and what's the average tenure? You know, Ben, again, you talked about, you know, gone are the days of having people that stay with you for 10 years. Uh, you know, so how long are we keeping staff? What looks good for our business? Um, and, and measure, you know, things like absenteeism. And then again, there are ways to measure intention to quit, burnout risks, stigma, cultural barriers. Um, so we can actually start to quantify some of this stuff and look at the direct correlation to the, uh, you know, positive impact it's going to have on our business. Okay. I think I'm done now. Right, yes. Thank you very much for that. 
I'll, I'll pass on to Zoe and then we'll get to questions at the end. But thank you very much, <laughs> Sheila, for that. No problem. Zoe, over to you. Thanks, Roy. So I think um, really just following on from what Ben and Sheila now have both just been talking to you about um, is that we've said, you know, we need to attract the right people. We need to recruit them in the right way. We need to have something to attract them with. Um, and we need to make sure that um, our work isn't going to make us ill. Um, really what I, what I want to talk to you today about is one um, of many um, concepts that um, are starting to become quite popular um, topics at the moment um, and that's the four day work week. So um, the four day work week is something that you may or may have not have heard of um, but slowly is becoming a hot topic. Um, it is a relatively new concept and um, it's come about due to some real advancements in technology that can allow us to do this. So while robots, um, you'll be pleased to know, aren't quite ready yet to take over our jobs completely, um, the use of technology, it's thought, really could help um, us to reduce the, our working hours um, each week. A number of the companies have already have trialled this and they've reported some really promising results for both the employees and the employers. Um, there are now calls for our government to um, help with the trying of this, to enable employees um, to work less hours um, for the same rate of pay. Yep, yeah, crazy, I know, um, but uh, surely the company is going to suffer all these questions that we're going to have. Well, you know, not necessarily. Um, with the use of greater technology, employees are able to produce the same amount of work in less time, uh, so it seems. Um, a four day work week, um, I think it's important to understand it isn't about um, compressed work schedule. So we're not doing the same amount of hours. Uh, we're not doing 40 hours a week in four days. It is about pro rata in those hours down to four days a week um, and um, having a three day weekend. So you know, we're going to look at some of the benefits of this and we'll come on to pros and cons as well. But um, the reason why I kind of want to talk about it today is, like I said, it is becoming more and more of a hot topic. And um, just recently, um, the SNP uh, announced that they were going to run a trial um, and they were going to pump £10 million um, into um, supporting business, is, businesses that wanted to take part in this trial. Um, and the um, Scottish government spokesperson uh, actually said the, the pandemic has served um, to intensify interest in and support more flexible working practices, which could include which it could include a shift to a four day uh, working week. Reductions in the working week might help sustain more and better jobs and enhance well-being. So all of what we've kind of talked about, really. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the, the, the working environment is more and more of a focus now we've had to change and adapt and we've seen that some of these more flexible working practices you know can work for businesses um and i think this four day week work week is taking that to a whole other level um and you know these businesses need to have the access to the technology to allow for this but it's certainly something that um i think we'll see more and more of it you know in the coming months years um the since the initial results were revealed it's um it's believed that around um 65 percent of um workers in iceland now after their trial are working um shorter hours uh and or they're gaining now a right to to work those shorter hours to to ask for that right um without a cut in pay um so I think it's fair to say for many that, you know, 50, 60 hours a week are a thing of the past. And there has always been, you know, um, focus on trying to, to make that reduction. Um, but now it's more important than ever to strike that work life balance um, for you as an employer, as well as the employee, because that's how we're going to attract and retain people. Um, that's how we're going to make sure that our staff um, come to work, are fit and well, and we reduce any absenteeism. Uh, next slide, if you wouldn't mind, please. Roy. So just to kind of talk through some of the pros and cons really with you now. So um, these things, you know, are real. They've come from real trials. Um, and I think that um, they, they certainly really open my eyes because it's not something that, you know, we've kind of 
talked about previously in HR for day work week. Um, and um, I think there's some real benefits to be had. So firstly, increased productivity. So studies from um, trials of four day working weeks uh, have shown increased job satisfaction, improvements in work life balance and teamwork whilst uh, maintaining productivity levels, if not actually increasing them. Um, increased engagement with less days of um, work in a week, employees are less likely to burn out, which going back to kind of some of what Sheila was talking about. So uh, it's something that I think is really, really important. Um, therefore, they're, they're happier, they're more committed and you know, less likely to have days off sick uh, or you know, potentially suffer with work related stress. Uh, equal workforce. So um, this is, I think, an interesting stat. Around 2 million people in Britain are unemployed due to childcare um, constraints. Um, for me, that was quite a shocking figure, actually. And a whopping 89% of those are women. Um, so a shorter working week could op open up some opportunities for those individuals um, um, with better options to juggle you know, work and childcare commitments. Uh, and another really interesting one is and something that we, you know, all I'm sure um, would be happy to to support is a reduction in the carbon footprint. So less commuting. Obviously, that's helped a little bit at the moment anyway. Um, but large office spaces um, now being only used four days a week. So um, these things all can have, you know, uh, environmental benefit as well. So what are the cons then? Well, you know, failure to adopt the right approach. So I, I mentioned um, briefly earlier that, you know, the four day work week means reducing the number of actual hours worked per week, as opposed to simply trying to get employees to work longer hours over less days. Um, by expecting employees to work the same hours over less days, you know, this is going to have a negative impact on their productivity, their work life balance and their satisfaction. And we're going to get that burnout. Uh, and then the other one really, the uh, not being able to meet client demands, um, closures, you know, leading to maybe customer complaints. So, you know, they can't get a hold of you on a Friday. Um, some customers perhaps not happy to use the technology. So things like chatbots and, and other automated functionalities um, you know, could lead to some customer dissatisfaction. Um, so. Will the rest of the UK follow um, Scotland and do some, begin some trials? I mean, who knows? But there's, I think there's lots to consider here in terms of the practicalities of operating on a four day work week. Um, but it does seem that there are really some significant benefits to be had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe, for that really insightful. Uh, and <clears throat> a quick question, if I may, before then throwing it out to Ooh, sure everyone here in, in the group uh, you're welcome either to put your questions in the chat box or just feel free to unmute yourself cameras on cameras off completely up to you uh, but a question for me is uh, what trends and priorities do businesses need to focus on to prepare for the future of work so i think in terms of trends some of the ones that we'll be quite familiar with really um hybrid working i think that's something that you know lots of businesses are looking to move to now and have done so somewhat naturally just from you know trying to go from working from home to getting their guys back into the offices um, and you know that's quite focused on an office environment because of course you know for many um, businesses that they, that kind of thing isn't an option you know face-to-face -face customer service that kind of thing um, but looking at how they can be a bit more flexible so the other the other thing really I think is is flexible working and um you may or may not be aware, but the government has actually um, launched into a consultation uh, into changing the current flexible working legislation. Um, and what that change will see is that um, employees can have the right to flexible working from day one, um, uh, which they don't have at the moment, because I think if anything, the, the, the government's recognised from through the pandemic that actually ex those external events like COVID um, uh, you know, and its impact on then the home life is not limited to those people that have got six month service. Um, it's from that there, that there and then. Um, so also for some of the um, perhaps underrepresented groups like parents, disabled workers, carers, um, it, it allows them with, to have some more flexible working opportunities. So we get to see what the rest of those changes look like. Um, it's thought that there's not going to be too many more, but um, yeah, the right from day one. So I think that those those couple of you know changes will again you know something for us to 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 get ready for. Um, 
and probably and priorities you know we've we've, we've talked about it right at, at well-being um and well-being done in the right way I think you know that that's important an important focus for sure um and then you know as Ben's already spoken about um I won't go over it too much but attracting uh engaging and retaining the right employees in the right way um certainly priorities for everyone super thank you very much Zoe and over to you the audience uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask comment give feedback however you wish hi can I ask Ben a question hi Ben how are you <laughs> <laughs> Hello, lovely to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I was just um, wondering if you could um, sort of explain a bit more about what industries are particularly uh, recruiting at the moment as a career coach with people working with people who need jobs. Um, it'd be interesting to know your thoughts on the if there's any industries in particular that are recruiting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I... I would say that the short term, um, the, the, the short term need has has been very, very widely reported drivers, isn't it? That, I, I think that's what what we're all seeing on the news. But I think connected to that, I think um, there is a real, real shortage um, of of low skilled workers. I think that in some ways, and, and I mean that in a complete non derogatory way, um, I we've. We are, I was reading an article about about um, there's a real problem with broccoli at the moment because they can't get anyone to pick the broccoli and broccoli just rotting in fields. Um, but I think that if if I was to put a careers hat on, um, it, it's very much science and tech. Um, and I think that um, that there is a real real desire with. Um, there's a real, real desire to get a lot of um, the minorities into um, science and tech. So, so one, one, one of our clients um, has been trying desperately, desperately, desperately to hire a female engineer for about two years. Um, it's not our bag and we don't recruit those type of roles, but they, it's a real thing that they're really trying to push. So I'd say um, science and technology um, is, is, is a real thing. And then I also think that fintech, um, so finance technology businesses are, if, if I were to be back in education and were, were to be starting my career again, I, I, I would absolutely go, go, go into the fintech space. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Are there any, um, just to, to further that, do you think there, those are the kind of industries, you, you mentioned salespeople in Oxfordshire is a, is a key one for you that you're struggling to find. Any other kind of particular roles that you're um you're finding hard to fill at the moment um we we we're, we're absolutely filling roles so so we you know we, we've had record month, months in a row we just have to work a lot harder for it I, I think <laughs> yeah. technical ish technical ish marketing roles that, that there is there there is a real shortage um so i think that the power of google taking over the world um i sort of say that a little bit of tongue-in-cheek um PPC is 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 something that so many businesses are looking to do, um, and Google ads, and, um, Facebook ads, social media ads, and and it's it's something that can work very very well. Um, you'd have to talk to a marketer because I'm certainly not an expert, but um, there is absolutely a real shortage of experts doing it. Um, a really really good friend of mine runs runs a digital agency um and their waiting list for new clients at the moment um is around about nine months um and clients are still are still joining that waiting list just because they're a really great agency with a great great reputation so so digital marketing particularly around the power of google is um it, it is a real shortage and actually that particular business um well sort of that particular business um are hiring a lot of remote workers um a lot of remote workers all across the uk because again they're, 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 there's a shortage in oxygen the oxygen topic is 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 one for another day but uh but yeah oxygen is a, a very unique workforce um which which yeah very interesting to talk about that one thanks very much thank you thank you, ben. Thank you tanya anyone else uh, well, there's a question that, in the chat one, box. Yeah, so I said there's one in the chat box there. Uh, probably That's quite right. Yeah, I've got a question yeah. here uh, from Mark Montague. So he's asking, how can previously implemented monitoring systems for employee health? So I think this is one for you, Sheila. 
uh, extend to a work from home program? And then I suppose part two of the question is how can employers be encouraged and not put off by fulfilling their duty of care? Thanks for that question, Mark. I trust you to come up with one like that. <laughs> um, it's a tricky one because, you know, with these kind of future initiatives with, with employers, you've got employers that will tick the box and do nothing more. And there are employers that truly look to fulfil that duty of care. So, um, you know, it, if we've got the employers, you know, if we've already got those systems in place, we've got the use of technology, we've got the use of different digital apps uh, and things that facilitate, I believe, doing that monitoring. Um, you know, we have tools that, that allow people to do, you know, these remote check-ins with people and understanding what their kind of individual well-being factors are and doing all of the, all of the risk assessment piece. Um, but, you know, employers need to be really committed to fulfilling this duty of care and, you know, in kind of looking at, um, you know, these work from home programmes, it's again, it goes back to what I said before, it's about constantly consulting, engaging and risk assessing those factors that are contributing or could potentially be contributing to people becoming stressed. So there has to be ongoing dialogue, ongoing communication, uh, and those ongoing risk assessments and that systemic process piece to make sure that we are completing our duty of care. It's not something that we pick up and we put down, you know? If we've got people working at home from a physical perspective, are we doing the ergonomics on the desk? Are we providing the right chairs? Are we doing all of the right things so that they're physically healthy? then we surely need to be doing the right things to make sure that they're psychologically healthy. And this is where it really needs to be embedded as part of that culture and that systemic um, piece in the business. So I hope that answers the question for you, Mark. Thank you, Sheila. <clears throat> I think, Anyone Sheila, that's, um, it's a really good point, actually, um, Sheila, is, to, is the ongoing piece. And, and also probably picking up on doing some of this stuff that might not have been done because actually for a lot of businesses um people had to make that switch to work from home overnight um and so i think would be forgiven initially for not doing assessments whether people have got the right work and space and everything else because actually we had no choice and everybody did the best they could um but what we need to be careful of is that we don't forget about that stuff now because, oh, well, they've just been doing it for the last 12, 18 months, so everyone's just fine. Um, and it's just slipped into the way that we work as opposed to actually having any thought around that and looking at what what impacts, you know, what has been impacted, what's been good, what's been bad, what do we need to learn from and what do we need to change? So um, I think that you know, it, it was it's easy just to continue just to work from home, but we do need, need now need to take, a bit of a um pause and say right okay what does that look you know, like? how are we going to do this going forward and what's right and what should we be doing and what is our duty of care absolutely you know it's like now it's like 12 months later who's struggling with a bad back because you've been sat at your yeah. table you know we, and if, if you say if the hybrid working is going to continue what does that look like in terms of bringing all of that um health uh, internal health um stuff um, yeah. out of the workplace because it doesn't go away just because we're not sat at the work desk. No, and, and employers shouldn't be nervous of this stuff as well because it's difficult for small businesses, right? You know, not you know, everyone's got, you know, a whole mental health and well-being plan. That's okay. It's just about doing the right thing by your employees and having the right, you know, and offering the right support and being aware of it um, mm -hmm. and reaching out for advice when, you know, you're not sure of something. Um, we shouldn't be kind of worried about this stuff either um but we certainly should be thinking about it i'm just reflecting on zoe's comment earlier about the four-day working week which is really interesting as i think we know we haven't got a great productivity track record in this country and we need to catch up in certain areas so did France also propose this? Did it ever get into legislation or was it just talked about? I seem to remember reading some article and you mentioned Scotland as well. 
yeah i'm not aware of anywhere that's that's in, that's imposed as um as legislation but um that there are a number of countries that have trialed it in various different ways um and actually from quite some years ago some of them started in i think one of the last trials i think one in iceland was sort of 20 15 to 19 um so it, it has been going on for a long time but i think that it's just kind of come back to the forefront and i chose it as the topic today with the smp just in september sort of set, you know putting this pledge that they were gonna um you know pump 10 million pounds into trying this concept so it's quite interesting and it's getting closer to home and i wonder when the rest of the country will sort of follow suit and um and start to we'll start seeing more trials but like i say again you know the the, the issue could be as well that it you know it's going to be difficult for smaller businesses who don't have some of those you know that technology in place that's going to allow some of some of these um concepts because then how does that then leave us when we're trying to recruit people you know ben said already today that you know that the employee it's, it's the candidate market right so they're going to be looking for lots of this stuff and it's going to be difficult then sometimes for other employers to compete perhaps i think you're right and there's also a prison that we haven't talked about but i have heard that uh, you get into sort of iron says it's all to do with offices when in fact you think of manufacturing or the nhs or hospitality or something they can't they really got to be in the workplace to, to deliver their duties as yeah. well so it's it's a balance yeah uh, and that's why you know um it, yeah same with hybrid working like i said well you know with this flexible working piece obviously that opens it up to some of those slightly for some some of the other industries with a different type of offer um but um yeah i, I think that you say it's 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 not something for everyone mm. Thank as you. well there's no one silver bullet solution fits all you know when you look at things like um go back to the iso standard you know one of very one of the very key things in the beginning of that standard understand your organization in its context understand what your customers need what you're really would, yeah um you can't just go you know it might be a combination of hybrid working and a four week it might be a combination exactly. it might be that everybody exactly. needs to be in the office there's no one single size fits all because every business is unique and i think it's about employees and employers Working exactly. to yeah. best so for everybody. Have to be yeah. Thank you. If I may, Rowan, over to you. You have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's leading on from the from the four day working week. So that's something that I I would really like to try and do. Um, but our industry is, is difficult in our industry because our loving public already want us to work seven days a week or eight days a week if they could. So. Um, so it's tricky. And I think that my question is about um, you're talking about because this would be my um, choice as well. If we pro rata down the hours, so actually it became 32 hours a week rather than 40, but the same pay. If we did that, it wasn't a trial. It's just it's an HR question, I guess. So this is just what we do. We decide this is what we're doing and we go for it. But let's say six months time, we just realize that the business need is such that we can't carry on doing 32 hour weeks it has we have to go back up to 40 at that point pro rata the hours back up to 40 what do you do with the pay does the pay then have to pro rata up or well that all depends obviously on, on what the business decides but then i mean from an eight i actually mean from an hr law point of view or an employment law point of view what what i mean if you're increasing people's hours do you not have to increase the pay proportionately well, I mean, it depends on, no, not necessarily, if, the offer, if that's what the offer is, and that's what you'd have to consult over, right? But I think that, yeah, you're going to be increasing back up to a 40 hour week is automatically yeah. going to come with the problems, right? And, you know, in, in, you, you're going to probably see yourselves offering something else um, as a as an incentive um, to get those employees across the line. Now, it depends, again, on how many more people jump on work four day working week if it becomes you know something that's that's um common practice then again you go back to the very beginning of struggling to to recruit people because of what you're offering um but you know it's not to say you wouldn't be able to do it but i think anyone, anyone yeah i guess it was, it was more a question about the i don't know this is not really not really a recruitment um question it's more about the employees that we've already got that we pro write yeah. down to 32 hours if they then get pro write back up to 40 do they not have a a uh no, if it's part of well, if the part of the consultation is that we you know have a business need now to to increase our hours back to this 
this working week um, and your pay remains the same. It's the same way of going the other way, right? But it's whether you get all of those people on board during consultation or not, at which point you could lose people. So why would you have to, but you have to consult on it. You have to consult on bringing their hours back up. Yeah, yeah. you'd have to go through a consultation period to enable you to do that. And they'd all have to agree to the new contract at that higher rate. So I think getting people's buy-in for that, that's where that might be tricky then. And then obviously that could result in you then losing people because if the only option is for at the end of the consultation is that well, this is what we're going to go ahead with, you either agree to the new contract or you know there's the potential they lose their role, you could you could see yourself losing people. Yeah. So from the employer's perspective, it makes it sort of unattractive to trial it in the first place. Well, a trial would be different, right? Because it would be very clear to the employee that this is a trial and depending on the success would mean we'll depend on the results. So if it's if it's successful, then we'll continue and this will become a permanent change to your terms and conditions. Mm. Um, if not, it's very clear that we will be reverting back to your previous terms and conditions. So a trial will be very different to just making the jump of a, as a permanent change. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. I think, yeah, Rowan, I think I agree with what Zoe says. And I think part of your discussions with your staff will be the kind of language you use. So, for example, if you're saying we're going to go down to pro rata of, say, 32 hours a week, but pro rata by its own nature will mean that your staff are expecting a reduction in pay. But if actually what you're saying is your, your pay is going to stay the same, but then you may pro rata back up to 40, they're going, they are going to expect a jump in their salary. But if, as Zoe says, actually we're trialing it, your pay will remain the same. It's up to you because as a business, you're going to find it tricky to unilaterally change their contracts anyway, because you may have someone actually say, actually, no, I'm actually quite fine working my five days or six, seven, eight, nine, ten days uh, a week in that sense. So, yeah, I think Zoe's right in terms of the language you use, trialing it first, uh, letting them know it's not a unilateral change to a contract, ask them for their consent, etc., and so on and so forth. I think to that point, I'd also wonder whether we'd build in a sort of three month review period and keep it going because if the needs of the business show it, it's a good idea, but actually it doesn't work terribly well operationally, then we might have to revert back to type. So I would, I would have staging posts in there just to check it really, really works for the business as well. I think particularly in, in our type of industry, which is peaks and troughs through the year. So, so the, the activity in the spring is, is much greater than the activity in the winter. You've gone on mute. Sorry, Rowan. Uh, so I was just saying, especially in an industry where it's peaks and troughs through the year. So our activity is great in the spring, but it's it's low in the winter. So we, we'd almost need a 12 month trial um, period just to see if it if it's actually feasible. I, I really I, I want to do it. I was I was wanting to do it regardless. But um, but, you know, but we have to work weekends. Our, our job is a, is a you know, so. And we say no to Sundays and people get furious about it, <laughs> but, I just, but I refuse to do it. So, uh, so we're going to have to find a way of continuing to, to support every day of the week, well, six days a week working. Um, otherwise, we'd lose business. We just we would lose instructions, um, let alone viewers. It's the, it's the sellers that would stop using us because they think that we wouldn't be able to sell the houses if we weren't, if we weren't offering coverage on a weekend. Um, so, so it's a little tricky for us. Mm. The key, though, will be to be clear on your communication. So clear what the plan is, um, you know, what those measures are, what does success look like, what will happen if we don't, you know, if it's not successful. It, you know, is if you're clear on mapping out what the plan is, how you plan to um, uh, approach it, approach it, and what the trial means and what it looks like, then you know that's always um, the key, the key to success with it, really. Right, agreed. So thank you very much for everyone's questions and, and thoughts and comments there. Just ending on, on picking up on something that, that Sheila talked about there in terms of uh, mental health. Uh, a recent study by a charity mentioned that about 13 employees, that 13% rather of employees will be comfortable about talking about mental health. That's statistically so low, uh, especially considering that uh, another statistic read that about 89% of workers with mental health problems report their impact on their working life. So there's much to be done in that sector. And there's certainly much to be done in terms of how, as businesses, as the recent discussion has just shown, how we can prepare for the future of work, both on an ongoing basis from a HR perspective, 
and certainly from a recruitment one too. It's been a real pleasure having this discussion. So say thanks to uh, Ben, Zoe and Sheila uh, and to all of you uh, for uh, joining in and for your collaborations. Wish you all the very best and have a great day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.